It wasn't that she was poor. It's that she was a widow. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us when her husband passed away. Could have been recently. And if it was, she had to deal with all of the emotions of losing her husband. She would have had to dealt with all of the emotions of being alone. And you have to understand, during the biblical days, it was very, very difficult for someone to remarry. See, a woman back in biblical days had a dependency upon their husbands, okay, for their security. And if her husband had just died, then that security was now gone. The other thing that I see in this, and this is, of course, conjecture on my part, but I still believe it, and you don't have to, but I do, because the Bible talks about if children, if, if a parents have children, their children are to take care of them. And so if she had children, she wouldn't be poor. So here she was all alone if this was the case. Or if the husband had been gone a long time and she stayed a widow all this time. She, she hadn't experienced any new love in her heart for anyone or a relationship with anyone. She was alone. And so she had to deal with that if her husband had died many years ago. Nevertheless, she was a widow. She was dependent on her own self to provide for her own self. Amen? Which is very difficult in biblical days. So we understand that if it was a short time that her husband passed, she suffered. If it was a long time passed, she still suffered. So in this suffering as a widow, not only could she have to fend for herself, but she was poor. I want to talk about this woman's character. Now, I've read commentaries say, well, we don't, under, we don't know what her character is, but I kind of can guess what her character was because of what she did. How many know that you can tell a person's character by what they do? By what they do? <clears throat> I want to talk about her character for a moment. Because the Bible says that she gave everything she had to live on. I know the prosperity preachers will preach this and say, see, give everything to God right now. God will bless you. That's not what this is about. I want to talk about her character. Some of us can't even let go of the dollar in our pocket. Why is that? Because our hearts are evil. We're more concerned about me, my well-being, my, I, and not God. This woman had the characteristic of a true follower of Christ. Now let me say this. This is before Jesus died. This is before the old became new. This is before the nature of God came to live inside of her. Hello? And yet gave her will over to God and pursuing God and wanting what God wanted her to do. And so her character speaks here loudly that she put the things of God and God before everything and anyone else, including her own need. She just didn't give a portion of what she had. It says that she had given everything she had to live on at that moment. That's like you going to church and God speaking to your heart and there's a need and you're on social security 
And God says, give it all in the offering. What's the first thing that we do? We begin to reason and rationalize. And we say, but God, I have bills. But God, I have this. But God, I have that. Let me tell you a story. True story. A pastor friend of mine was telling me the story that he knew this pastor. And he, they had about 100 people in their church. And so they had been saving up for the last 10, 15 years because they owned a piece of land right next door and they were going to build a new church. So they saved over the years and they saved about $50,000. <clears> and... Um, so one day, you know, the Lord started speaking to this pastor. There had been a church that moved in five years earlier, about a mile and a half, two miles down the road. And they had over uh, 2,000 people in it, I believe it was. Big, huge church. And they were, they were building a school project. And God had spoken to this pastor of this little church and said, I want you to give the $50,000... To that pastor for that work. Now, I would have loved to have been a fly at that board meeting. <clears throat> pastor, are you crazy? Pastor, are you, it took us years to save up that money for our building, and you want to give it away? See, that's the natural man, and the natural will always try to talk you out of doing what God wants you to do. Don't worry, I'm not taking an offering again. And so what happened was, God kept dealing with this pastor, dealing with this pastor, so finally he said, listen, he said, do you trust me, congregation? Have I made right choices? Have I followed the Lord? And they said, yes, you have, pastor. He said, I really believe God wants us to do this. And they said, well, okay, go ahead. So he Called the pastor, made up an appointment, and he went there, and he sat in his office, and he said, um, Pastor, he says, God's been dealing with me for the last month to give you this. He said, I just had to wait on the Lord to convince my congregation, you know, and board members. He said, but they all agree now, and we want you to have this. And he opened up, and it was a cashier's check for $50,000. He said, but Pastor, he says, you have such a little church, and this is, from what you told me, this is your building fund. And he says, we got like 2,000 people. We can, we can afford this. He says, God told me to do it. So the pastor said, okay. Long story short. About a year and a half goes by. And this pastor at this big church, he's got a visitor. The visitor came from Texas. <clears throat> and he comes and he sits down with the pastor. He says, hey, how you doing? You know, and he starts talking back. He says, hey, listen. He says, I, I, I have some money that I, I've invested and I got some money. He said, I'd like, to, I'd like to bless somebody. Do you know somebody that really needs a blessing? And the pastor thought, and he said, yeah. He said, there's a little church down the road, okay, that when we were building our offering, when we were building our building, they gave an offering of $50,000 from their own building fund that they didn't really have, but they gave it. He said, what's the pastor's name? So he gave him the pastor's name. So anyway, Coria, a couple of days later, goes to the little church office, says to the secretary, may I see the pastor? He says, well, he's not here right now. He says, well, here, I got this envelope. He says, please, he says, make sure you give it to him, put it on his desk, don't let him lose it. Okay, I just want to bless him. He says, okay. So she puts it on his desk, and you know, later on in the afternoon, the pastor comes back in. And she says, oh, by the way, there was a gentleman here um, he was a friend of the pastor down at the big church down there that we gave the offering to. He came and he, he wanted to give you a little blessing, he said, so he put it on the table. So the pastor went in his office. He sat down. He opened it up and he began to cry. It was a check for $500,000. Enough to build that church and pay cash for it. You can never, never outgive God when you give God His 
and what belongs to him. Here this poor widow gave out of what she had to live on. And of course we can all make up excuses. Well, I got a gas bill, I got lights, I got, I got food, I got this. Come on, been there. You don't, you know, people see, you know, Linda and I, we drive nice cars now, we, we have our own home. Oh, no, it wasn't always like that. We lived on one floor in that house. My dad lived downstairs. We had to pray sometimes our food in. Sometimes Linda had to pray for clothes. And, and I tell you, God was always faithful. Bags of, she'd go out to her car, there'd be garbage bags full of clothes. Never told anybody. Garbage bags full of clothes, her size. Dresses, blouses. She wore those things for years. Never complained. Never complained. Here this poor widow had given everything she had to live on. Number one. <coughs> what that tells me is that this woman had a profound ability to trust God. She had an insight about who this God was she worshipped, who she served. She knew the word of God. She knew that God would take care of her because in Jeremiah 49, 11, it says this, and I'll wait for you to put that up there, Pastor. Jeremiah 49, 11. Leave my fatherless children. I will preserve them alive. And let thy widows trust in me. Whew. Put it in the NLT for me, please. But I will protect the orphans who remain among you. Your widows, too, can depend on me for help. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She had the right motives. She gave out of what she had need of. Not out of her uh, surplus. She didn't have extra. She gave out of what she had need of and therefore trusted that God would provide for her. Amen? God would provide for her all that she had need of. In Jeremiah 17.10, it says this, But I, the Lord, searcheth all hearts and examine Secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. God rewards action. But he also rewards the motive behind the action. If you have the action without the right motives... What did Jesus say? He says, you ask and you pray and you have not, and you have not because you, because you ask to keep it up for yourself. And can I tell you from personal testimony that when you give, God always gives. When you give to God, He always gives back. Always. He may not bless monetarily in money, but he'll bless in other ways. And if you need the money, guess what? He'll come through. He does so all the time. I told you the story of the, when I, that fireman passed away and I wanted that singer to come. and It cost $150. Okay? And I gave it. I paid for it personally because I didn't want to take it out of the ministry. That was something that I wanted to do. 
And about what was it? Like three weeks later, I get a, 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 a letter in the mail from uh, the yacht club where I security guard. And they said, "Oh, we had money left over, and guess what? We're blessing you." It was one hundred and fifty-three dollars. It was one hundred and fifty plus three dollars extra. Hallelujah. Yesterday I got the mail. I got a letter from the town of Fairhaven. It said, Pastor Bob, we have noticed that you've had a check outstanding since December. And you haven't cashed it. We bring you the check in and we'll we'll give you a new one. I don't have a check. So I'm gonna have to go down there and tell them, well, you just give me a new one because I don't have the old one. Another blessing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Came into church today, got a Pentecostal blessing. Hello. And I said to the Lord, you know what I'm going to do? I said, that blessing that comes to me like that, I'm putting away for the mission trip. Because this one's going to be a big one. This one I have to go from Boston to Dubai, five-hour layover in Dubai, another 14 hours, uh, 16 hours to Bangalore. I'll be in Bangalore for seven or eight days because I have two pastors I have to see, Pastor Sajiv, and another pastor that I, I have is a friend of mine from the conference. He says, you're going to be in Bangalore? He says, I'm from Bangalore. He says, you've got to stop and see me. <clears throat> so i got to buy a one-way ticket from here to there. Now, don't get nervous. And then from there, I got to go to Nigeria. So it's all in one trip. So I don't have to go there and fly 22, 24 hours, come back, and then another week or two, go fly another 12 hours. It's not worth it. So if I can get the ticket that way in the hotel and all that stuff, and I'm just going to trust the Lord. So I talked to Robert this morning. We're going to set up a GoFundMe page. And I want you to... Just spread it around. Just give it to your friends. Tell them, say, this is a pastor. He's very, very um, um, trustworthy with the money. And this is what he, he needs to raise. And I'll let you know when we get the cost of the aircraft, airplanes and, and hotels and all that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> believe me, I have another. I, 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 I could go to Nepal in northern India, but I, I won't do that because it's going to be too much, too far. I'll be a too, too, uh, way too much. And physically in my body, I don't know if I can handle Nepal. But I could go there. I have a, an invitation to go to Croatia and Russia. But in God's timing. Amen? I'm telling you, you don't realize what God does to this little tiny church and how, what a blessing it's been in people's lives. You know, God chooses the poor of this world, rich in faith. James chapter 2, verse 5 says that. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. You got that up there? How can my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? Now see, a lot of prosperity preachers don't like this scripture. <clears throat> Hath not God chosen the poor of this world rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? See, God doesn't want everyone rich because everyone can't handle wealth. But he said he'll meet your needs according to his riches in glory. Amen? This woman's character, she had trust. She heard from God. Her heart's desire was to please God more than herself. She had the right perspective. She had her things in order. It was God first. 
Hello? It was God first, then herself. It was God's needs first, then her own. Because she could trust God. Do you understand that? She could trust God. The other identity of her character was she was obedient. Ask yourself the question right now. Some of you, this would be very, very difficult for. If God said, I want you to take all your money that you saved up and give it away. Hello? And your 401. What if he was to tell you that? Take all your money out of all your savings, everything, and give it away and come and follow me. <clears throat> Let me say this. If that pastor had not given that 50000 was it difficult? Yes. Was it a hard decision? Yes. Think about it. You got $50,000 in the bank. Probably Jesse does. I don't know. $50,000 in the bank. And God says, want you to give it in the sanctuary. Some of you would be binding devils. I bind that devil in Jesus' name that spoke to me that. That's not God. God wouldn't tell me to give it all. He wouldn't. He would tell you to give it all. That's what he wants. He wants you to give it all. He wants your attitude to change. And I'm not talking about money here. I'm talking about your money and your service. to. I'm, I'm talking about your attitude and service to God. Your attitude makes all the difference in the world. How you look at things makes all the difference in the world. That's why he, the Bible says he loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. You know, people say, give until it hurts. No. Give until you can't stop laughing. Amen. How can my brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith? I hear, I hear pastors say this all the time. Well, if we only had money, we could do a lot more. Well, just do what you're supposed to be doing. Don't worry about doing more, because doing more not necessarily means that it's God. The Bible says whatever you find your hand to do, do. Whatever is in your ability to do, do. But sometimes God will ask of you more than you think you can give of yourself. I remember when I took the, uh, took the uh, a team of us went to Guatemala. Never been on a mission trip before. And Pedro took him to this little town where there was a garbage dump. And some of the some of the ladies went. And when they started walking through, they began to tear up because they saw that that's where people lived. And can I tell you, right now, as we're sitting here, enjoying our nice church with our heat and nice automobiles and nice homes, food on our table, they're still in that dump. And they're still searching for their food every day from what people have thrown away. Hello? That's how they live. 
We are a blessed people. And I said that because maybe God would have you come with me on a mission trip. Hello? She says, I'll go. Yeah, we have to deal with Louie, though. Praise the Lord. Can I tell you, when you go on a mission trip, you will never be the same. When you give of yourself to God fully, 100%, holding nothing back, you say, God, here I am. Use me. Use me for your glory. He will when you have the right attitude. As one person once said, your attitude will determine your altitude. Change your attitude, and it will change your altitude. You'll be able to go higher in God. Hallelujah. You'll be able to mount up with wings as eagles. You'll be able to soar. See, because... People look according to appearance, and if you see a church of small amount of people, they think that's not successful. I don't believe that for a minute. Success isn't measured by how many people you have. Success is measured by when it looks like everything's going wrong and you're struggling and you can't make it, and you stick to it, and you don't give up, and you continue pressing through. That's success even in the midst of failure. Everybody wants to have this big thing, you know. 1 Samuel 2.3 says this. I'll be done shortly. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Listen to me now. Let this be deposited in your spirit. What man overlooks, God sees. Man didn't even pay attention to those two little mites going into that thing. Some of them had attitudes probably looking and saying, well, why are you even bothering? But wasn't it God in human flesh that noticed it? He saw her, and not only that, but inspired Mark to write it so that you and I could hear about this little incident of this little woman doing something so insignificant, maybe. A third of a penny or half a penny, whatever it was, going up and and putting in, never thought in her wildest dreams that 2,000 years later, somebody would be preaching about her very action. Can you imagine if she could be here today? talking about me I'm, I'm, I'm just a poor widow I gave half a penny what? no 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 sister it's not that it's your heart it's your attitude it's your character it's your integrity you put all of those things first before your money Sometimes God will make you go two steps back before you go one step forward. I've heard testimony of testimony about that. You gotta go to Bristol Elder first. Ooh, two dollars an hour. Ooh. Ooh, that's especially when you need it. Ooh, yeah. That that's not God. God's in the promoting business. He's in the pushing forward business, not the retreat business. And aren't you glad you did? Same with Tara. 
I've been getting on her for a couple of years to apply for a job there. She was holding down almost two jobs, two jobs, almost three, trying to make ends meet. I can't tell you what a blessing she received. Because she didn't start where you started. I remember calling her on the phone. And she said, I got the job. I said, oh, did they start you like so-and-so? No. Was it this much more? No. Was it this much more? No. Was it this much more? No. Yes. It wasn't 20,000 more. It was 30, I believe, almost. Wow. Come on, somebody. Don't tell me God can't bless you. She's not a widow, but she's a single mom. What a blessing God has given us. And then she gets a car free. A brand new car. Almost free. Hello. Hello. Well, it's because she got it from her dad. It doesn't matter. God will use the devil to bless you. Hello? Think about it. This woman had integrity and character. She had obedience. We just look at the coins. You see the little lady dropping in the coin, the little widow. But she would never be able to do that. And understand, she didn't have Holy Ghost. There was no Pentecost yet. She didn't have the Holy Ghost living inside of her. So don't tell me if you got the Holy Ghost, you can't do this. I can't do that, Pastor. I can't. Yes, you can. You don't want to. Pray that God will break that stubborn, idolatrous spirit that's in you. Hello? That's what it is. It's a stubborn, idolatrous spirit. Give God everything. Do you think it's fun to travel? You know, everybody thinks it's glamorous, you know. <gasps> you're going to be a missionary. You're going to travel around the world. It's so beautiful. Yeah, if you're on a cruise ship. <laughs> if you're going to all the exotic places like Italy and Greece and, you know, Israel. And you're going to all these nice places. When you go into hotels that have rats and cockroaches, and you wake up and there's a there's a, a a rat about that big walking across the windowsill in your room, and the roaches are flying because they got they're so big. You got those little gecko lizards running around. You can't drink the water. That's fun? Mm. But your pastor did it. Your pastor slept in rooms that were bugs running in underneath the door, little tiny mice running in outside the door. It's not fun. Well, that's because you're called. Mm, so are you. Yes, you are. Going to all the world is not just for pastors or those that have a calling of missionary. That's a, that's a call, a mandate to go into all the world and preach the gospel. What I said earlier was this. When you realize what Jesus has done for you, there's nothing that you won't do for him. When you come to that full revelation of what he has done for you, you will do anything for him. Even give up your life. When I was in India and I, I was so sick, I was, I was there and the, and the Lord <coughs> kept me. And the pastor said to me, it was like about three weeks before I was supposed to leave. He said, why don't you go home? He said, you're too sick. 
You know what I told him? I didn't go, oh, you know what? Gee, that's a good idea. You know, I'm so sick. I, I think I will go home early. Yeah, it's okay. No, you know what I told him? I said, listen, God sent me here. And if I die standing behind that pulpit, then so be it. God sent me here to India. And I'm going to fulfill what he said. He said, six weeks, I'm staying as tough as it was. I lost 45 pounds in those six weeks. Rode on a motorcycle, dysentery every single day. Bouncing around. Going into cars. You see, you see, we have a car here, you know, we put six, seven people maybe. Okay, they put 13. Okay. And they don't use deodorant. And you're all jammed in. People on your lap, they're on, somebody's on their lap. And that's not for 20 minutes. That's for two or three hour drive. You go way up into these villages. You pray for somebody and they get healed. You say, well, I could never do that. That's right. I could never do that either. But it's not me doing it. When you realize how much he has done for you, there's nothing you won't do for him. That should be the motto of every Christian. This poor widow. Let me read it one more time. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, verse 43, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want, of her want, did cast in all that she had, even all her living. <coughs> Imagine. What a woman of God. You know, there were people that served God and loved God before Jesus came, you know. The Jews. There were some that earnestly sought after God. They were still lost. They sought after God. They went through the temple. The offerings meant something to them. When they killed an animal and they had to shed blood, it meant something to them. Of course, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you read the verse before that, it says that Jesus rebuked the scribes because they, they devoured widows' houses. Kind of like the preachers on TV. I better not go there. Some ministries even want you to will over your fortune to them when you die. Oh, yeah, they'll send you all the farms. What you do is you, you put them as the recipient of, of all your wealth when you die. They want your money when you're dead. You're just merchandise to them. Now, how about take care of your children? I believe in that. You take care of your children, you bless them, and then if you have something, you give it to, back to the church. Now, some people don't believe that. Some people say, well, you know... The, uh, my children are not serving God. They're a bunch of devils. They're going to spend it all on, on sin. I'm not giving it to them. Well, maybe you got a point there. I don't know. How many want to be like that widow? I do. I want to be like that widow. I don't want to hold anything back. Are you tired of holding back your life? Never mind your money. You go out there, you work, you work, you work, you work, you work, you work. For what? The abundance of a man is not measured by the possessions which he owns. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? They put everything first. Can't go to church because I got to do this. Can't go to church because I got to do that. Have the spirit of this woman, this widow. It amazes me. I don't know. It amazes me. I don't know if it amazes you. That this widow who did this insignificant little thing to her has been preached and talked about for thousands of years. And she thought no one would ever know 
No one would ever notice. But Jesus did. And we don't even know if Jesus talked to her and told her. It doesn't say that. But can you imagine? That's why some of the things that are best kept secret are the most rewarding. It's not only to boast and say, look what I did. I gave this or I did that. Or, look, how, look how much I gave in missions. Look how I did for this. I, I, we did that. We did that. No, no, no. Sometimes the most hidden things that are done in secret, God will reward you openly. Amen? I want to be like that widow. The church in Macedonia was a church of great poverty. Yet even out of their great poverty, they blessed the Apostle Paul. Amen. Maybe I should take an offering. Offering time is blessing time. Be encouraged this morning. You may feel like your life has got nothing to offer. But if this woman could offer those two mites in obedience, it's her attitude. It's what she believed, and it was her attitude that meant all the difference. Think of the insecurity she must have felt. I remember one time, I'll just close with this. I remember one time being at, uh, and now let me just say this too because I forgot all about it. Um, Brother Norman Noriga is celebrating his 44th year of ministry. And he contacted me and he asked me, he said, would you, he said, I know you can't be there because you have a service, but would you write a, a letter? You know, and I said, sure. So I wrote him a letter of, of how much I appreciate him. And he was my first pastor and all, all that. And uh, he wrote back and said, thank you. It was well written. So they're having a celebration this morning, 44 years of ministry. Don't think of all the bad, some of the bad things that happen. Yeah, bad things happen all the time. Look at the good. He's persistent, still, still, still in ministry, still fighting a good fight of faith. And that's what I look at. All the rest God will judge. But keep him in your prayers. Keep that ministry in your prayers. <clears throat> that he's been a blessing. So many people have gotten saved through that ministry. I've gotten saved through that ministry. And uh, I thank God for Pastor Norman, Mariga, and uh, the church over there. And God bless them this morning. And just remember, little becomes much when you place it in God's hands. And if you feel insignificant like you haven't got nothing, don't feel that way. Because God will use you if you have the right attitude. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. God, I ask, Lord, that you would, by your Holy Spirit, embed your word into our hearts and minds and give us the same attitude, Lord, and the same altitude that this woman had. Lord, she gave all that she had out of her living, not caring about her own situation, but putting you first and knew that you would, she could put her trust in you. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this message. It has challenged my heart. It has it is made me to feel indebted and responsible and accountable what you're doing in my life and I thank you Father for that woman I thank you for her obedience God to, to be able to go, do something so insignificant in the eyes of man but tremendous in your eyes and Lord you will bless the little that we have and you do and we give you praise for it now as we go our separate way Father I pray that this word will linger in people's hearts and they will reread this scripture They'll mull over it and ask God, God, what is it you want to do in me that needs to be done so I can be like this woman? No reservations, but to obey you, even in spite of great need. And so I thank you, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray you bless their going in, their coming out, their lying down, their rising up. Keep them safe. <laughs> And be with them, Lord, till we gather again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget, next week, the 18th, is when that parade's going to be going through. So you might want to try to find an alternate route, maybe Route 18. Go that way home if you can and go around because they're having that big parade. 
is going to be marching through the city. 